have two authors, two local veterinarians, John Hunt and David Jefferson, and they are visiting tonight to talk about their newest book, um, Animals in Danger. Um, it's a harbor, Tides Harbor Mystery. Tides Harbor Mystery. We'll talk and about And we that. love mysteries here in Berwick, so I know it's going to be fun to read and learn about. So. I'm going to attempt to cover a few of these oh, incredible bios that are for Dr. Hunt and Dr. Jefferson. Dr. Hunt practiced small animal uh, medicine in Bucksport, Maine for 27 years. Prior to that, he worked in three different vet hospitals in central Connecticut for five years. While in Bucksport, Dr. Hunt was scoutmaster, coached middle school, cross country, and high school indoor and outdoor track. He wrote for local newspapers, gave talks at elementary schools, started a radio show, and acted in local musicals and plays. And in his spare time, did veterinary work. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Squeeze it in. Squeeze it in. <laughs> Rabies shot here and there. I know. Uh, for a short time, he taught and was co-director of the veterinary tech program at Bangor Branch of University of Maine in Augusta. And he also taught at YCC, right? York County yeah. Community College Vet Tech Program. That's where I met this dude. You, oh, left, you left out one C. I did, yeah. I did. See, see, see. I didn't think it was <laughs> Time to read these things. Um, you've published three books now? Uh, this is my third, fifth. Fifth. Oh, fifth. you've got to update this for me next time. I might so. just keep, yeah. Five books. It'll be six pretty soon. Yeah, there we go. All right, I'm moving on to Dr. Yes, Jefferson. please. Not for me. Get Until his retirement, Dr. Jefferson was the owner of Maine Equine Associates, an ambulatory equine practice. He originally is from Pelham, New York, miles away from the nearest horse. His interest in horses began at Cornell University, where he earned his veterinary degree. Before college, David served as an enlisted U.S. Marine for three years. He attended the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Mechanic Falls, Maine, and is part of their team that visits jail inmates. He has been a literary literacy volunteer, working with adults who have difficulty reading, and that is a wonderful thing. I just read that, and it warmed my heart. Let's see. Dr. Jefferson served as the president of Lewiston Auburn Rotary Club, and Maine Veterinary Medical Association. He's an active board member of the Maine State Society for the Protection of Animals. In three years, he taught tech, vet tech students their large animal courses at YCCC <laughs> in Maine. Um, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Feel free to delve in deeper in this wonderful bio <laughs> that you provided I'm for me. Have. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having us. Thanks, thanks for coming out on this crummy day. Oh, I start? Okay. Dave and I have written two books together, and this is our first book. It's part of the history of this book. Is we, we, wrote, we wrote this book. It's called The Dog and Pony Show. And uh, Dave and I met each other at YCCC. We both were teaching courses there. And the first day before uh, classes were to start, we had to go to a, a learning seminar about the, uh, the, computer, the computer aspect of teaching. David and I n were neither, are neither very competent in computers and we were not interested. So we were not very good students, so we just started talking. We, had, we, were, we were spoken to a couple times to be quiet. We were just like little kids. So we, we, our friendship started there being bad students ourselves. Uh, and then during, we taught there for a couple of years and uh, we would meet at um, the cafeteria at YCCC and just have a cup of coffee and talk about the students and the courses. And we were learning a lot about each other and uh, friendship grew. And after the, uh, the teaching for a whole different story why we stopped teaching there, but we decided uh, to write a book about our experiences. And David is a large animal and I was a small animal. And the, the unique part of this is that 
this gives a reader what veterinarians, how veterinarians think and what they've done and how they feel and the parallels of large and small animal and the differences of large and small animal. A lot of people don't know much about large animal. And David's stories are just, I, I love David's writing. They, it's just, these chapters, are, they're, they're, pri they're priceless, they're priceless. And it really gives you an insight on large animal and then I try to share my experience as a small animal. And what we did, a unique thing in this book, at the end of each chapter, we have what's called afterthoughts, afterthought here. And that's the other guy commenting on the chapter of his, of his uh, the co-author. So I would comment on Dave's chapter and he would call And sometimes we'd, we'd jive each other and tease each other in, in this book. So this was, this was our first uh, book and it was really easy for us because we'd get on the phone and say, okay, what topic is, should we write about that's important to veterinary medicine? And we have, I mean, so we have a whole book full. One was a chapter called Oops which were mistakes we made and how we learned from them. Uh, we've, we had a chapter on how we, be, how we got interested. We didn't realize we lived. Pelham is just across the county from Dobbs Ferry, where I grew up on the Hudson River. So we actually grew with, up within 15, he grew up a little bit sooner than me, but uh, <laughs> 15, 15 miles away, 20 miles away, which is really interesting. We didn't know that. So that was kind of cool. But we cover... If anyone is interested, or if you know anybody, a teenager or whatever, that I want to be a vet, read this book, and it'll give you a real flavor of, mm. of what a veterinarian goes through mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, interactions with clients, the ups and downs of our, um, of our cases. I mean, there's some really funny things in here, and there's some very sad things. A lot of people don't understand when they, oh, I want to be a vet because I love animals. Yeah, but you also have to deal with the bad parts because that's your job. People come to you to solve a problem, not to cry along with them. We cry later, but we have to do our job. So this is, a, this is kind of how we, we, we got together. And it was really easy because he wrote his stuff, I wrote mine. So someone had a really stupid idea of writing a mystery. <laughs> Me. I don't know how it came about, really. I was talk we were talking to our boss at YCCC, and for some reason I thought mystery. So I talked to Dave, and Dave said, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I want a dead body. That's the first thing he said about writing a mystery. I want a dead body in the book. I, a dead body. He said a dead body. I think he meant a human body. Did you mean a human body, Dave? <laughs> you did, didn't you? I did say that. Yeah. <laughs> so there is silence on my side of the phone. <laughs> like, I said, so I had to explain. I said, well, Dave, if there's a dead body, then the police are going to come into it. And who's, why would the police want to be talking about veterinarians? Because the mystery is going to be, we're going we're gonna to have veterinarians in the mystery. So I, I kind of calmed him down on that. Um, so we decided to just that's, and the, go ahead. That's not, to, that's not to say that there isn't a dead body in here. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to spill the beans on that. That's right. Continue. Uh, the, the book is really John's brainchild, <sighs> and it was his idea. And I s thought, yeah, okay, this will be fun because we really, this book was, some, was a blast to write. Um, this wasn't as much fun for me because I, you know, John would say, okay, write a chapter in, in maybe about colic or something in horses. And so I'd write my chapter and then I'd always put the perpetrator of the crime in the story uh, right there and I would sort of spill the beans. And so John would have to say, this isn't going to work. You've already, you've told the reader who the perp is, Right. Mm -hmm. So I had to take chapter that. three. So he did. You want to do that chapter three? A lot of heavy editing went on over the phone. So it, it was not. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a, a little sort of a joke, which illustrates this. There's two golfers. One's named David, and one is named John. And John um, goes off to the golf course one day, and he's going to play with David. And um, 
But he comes home very late, and his wife says, John, where have you been? You know, it's like after dark. Uh, how many holes did you play? He says, well, I played a full 18. Well, what happened? Why, wh why is this, uh, you know, why, why are you so late? Then he said, well, about the ninth hole, David said he wasn't feeling well, and he died. So for the, rec nest, the, for the rest of the nine holes, it was hit the ball, drag David, hit the ball. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's sort of the way this, this book went, because... John would say, you got a chapter due. I said, I know. I, can't, I haven't got any ideas. So he'd give me a hint, and I would struggle to write the chapter sometimes. So he dragged me all the way through this book. But we're still friends. Yes. <laughs> and he was truly, I'm not underestimating the statement, he, he's a truly a saint in putting up with all the <laughs> BS I had to, to give him. Because he... David, by his own admission, and he found out through writing this book, he's a great short story writer, and he is. He is a great, but you can't write a short story that has a beginning and end as a chapter in a mystery novel. Because like he says, the mystery's not supposed to be revealed to the end of the book. Right, and we don't, re and we don't reveal to the end. And all the people that have read it have not, have not guessed who it is. No. That's, yeah. yeah. Or what it is, or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's really... It was a, a real collaboration, and, and David really was, you really were just super about all the trouble I <laughs> gave you. Because writing a mystery, you had, you had to remember details. You had to remember so-and-so was like this and said and did this, and if you mention that person two chapters later and you don't do it right, it's not consistent with what you said three chapters ago. People pick up on that. Yep. So yeah, and that's something we both had, both learned. I mean, you'd be pointing that out to me. You said, John, you know, blah blah blah, and I said, Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I'd look back. Since there are two authors, we didn't know by heart the chapters at the other, and we read them and stuff, but didn't know them as in, in too, in, intimately like our own chapters. So it made it really hard. And the other thing that gave it, got us through was our two wives. Yes. Here, Michelle, my wife, and Bonnie, Dave's wife, who were agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> patient, 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 and very supportive, and they were really good editors, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they were only two of five or six editors. And this, there's so many grammar changes now, so many things in grammar and commas and periods and spacing. It's been, it's been changing the last four or five years that... Um, that we didn't know about, but uh, Shell, Bonnie, and my, my daughter, Jane, she's an English major. She picked up on stuff, and then your, some of your friends picked mm -hmm. up on it. So mm -hmm. it was a, that was grueling. The editing was grueling. So all the little changes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes? If I remember right from reading the cover or something, that's the first in a series. Yes. That means you're writing again. Okay. <laughs> I wondered if this was going to come up. Okay. No, no, no. I said, John, I'm done with mysteries. Okay. And I said, fine. Are we still friends? And he said, yes. So, so he's already thirty odd chapters into the next. I'm almost finished with the next one. It's just, it just came he pouring has, out. He has come to me for some consultation about large animal issues, okay. which is um, perfect. Dave, Dave's got. I mean, he's the go-to guy for large animal. I was a small animal. <clears throat> so he's already given me some great, accurate, matter of fact, you had to check the chapter I, read, I wrote about something. Um, so he's going to check up on it, and uh, including uh, David's a, a great kite flyer. He likes to fly kites. So I have a little, something in the book about kite flying. So Why don't you guys talk about your characters and where they came from and how they came about? Oh, yeah. Without revealing too much. Yeah, so this book is um, about two veterinarians, a large animal and a small animal. And in, uh, the, throughout the book is also woven cases we are seeing, which have, most of them have nothing to do with the mystery. Well, I guess they do a little bit, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, and animals are, uh, animals Some, are being abused. 
and mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out, oh, there were so many that it was a pattern. Horses were abused, dogs were abused, cats were abused. But there wasn't a pattern, really. And we were trying to figure out who's the guy. Well, we, at first we didn't person? know we. Yeah. The doctor's Bob Smiley, and why did you pick Bob Smiley? He's oh. a large animal. How did you pick that name? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't remember, except I liked it. I liked the name. Was there another David said, I, I always wanted to be called Bob. That's what you said. <laughs> I don't remember I can just see him on the that. phone. I, I always wanted to be called Bob. <laughs> I don't remember that, but okay. Smiley. The Smiley, this I don't know. This makes a good story. The Smiley, David, you know the Smiley. That was Doc Smiley. Oh, that's right. A good friend from vet school's name yeah. was Smiley. That's right. That's right. And my character is uh, Charlie Harrison. My grandfather on my mother's side was Charlie, and my grandfather on my father's side was Harrison, first name. So Charlie Harrison, that's how I got. So there's a lot of truth in our fiction. And woven through the book is the dog that rides with me on calls, whose name is Jack. And Jack, in real life, used to be my dog that rode with me on calls. And so, and Jack loves donuts. <laughs> I'll say no more. That's right, no more. So Jack and his donuts are woven through the book. That's a fun, yeah. That is a fun, yeah, we got some, some good humor in yeah. there. And good characters. Uh, that's a good question, Michelle. Uh, there's a, a, char a good character I think you really love. His name is TC. And uh, he really was, he was modeled after a guy I really knew in Bucksport. His name was John. And he even looked up, did I show you the picture of T John? No, you oh, never did. With the owl? No. Oh, he looks just, I, the character is almost like this guy, John. But then, of course, I make the fictional character out of him. I, I kind of filled him out and made him some depth to him. Not quite what this real guy was like, but that's where he came from. And his initials, TC, is after my, uh, my school, that school friend that I'm still friends with, Tom Cameron. So it's TC. It's not Tom Cameron in the book, but it's TC. That's one. Who's your favorite character in the book? Is it TC? I think TC. Jack's, Jack's up there, the dog. <laughs> What's your, who's, who's your favorite character? Um, my, my, my favorite story in the book, that, the part that I wrote, is uh, my wife who had a drug issue earlier in her life. And not my real wife, but yeah, my fictional wife. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, Bob's. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That was a pretty, that's a pretty powerful chapter. Yeah. That came out of I nowhere. I like that one. When uh, Dave sent me that chapter, I won't say much about it, it was like, whoa. I, don't remember talking about that, <laughs> the storyline, which, which Dave did a lot. We'd say, okay, I want you to write, blah, blah, here's the storyline, here are the hints, whatever that you should put in. And he would come up with these stories like, whoa, <laughs> they're so original. So I changed the storyline. I don't know if I told you this. The storyline changed as Dave was feeding me his stories because he would write some stuff and it kind of cornered me, in, cornered me into changing the story to, to fit his story because I didn't want to change it because I respect his writing so much. So the original storyline, I never had original storyline. We just kind of... Really? I didn't know that, John. I thought, <laughs> I thought you did. I was making it all up <laughs> as, as we were going along. His wife may have suggested that he make a storyline. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. So, so that, was, that, that was kind of the give and take uh, that, that we had. Uh, a lot of small, my other characters I don't know about yours, please speak up. Uh, there's a, a lobsterman that was, uh, I modeled after an old lobsterman I knew up in Lubeck. I used to go up to Lubeck in the summers when I was a kid. Old Helbert McFadden, his name was. Mm. In the book, it's Al McFadden. And I describe him pretty much how he was in the, in the book in real life. And uh, a cute little chapter about him and his cat. It's, yeah. it's pretty cute. Pretty cute chapter. Which, uh, That's one of my favorites in the book. Yeah. Yeah, the cat, Halbert, or Al McFadden. How about a character that you made up? Any, did you make it up out of thin air, or was there a. Yeah, I think there aren't they always modeled after somebody, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, the, the character I had was the dairy farmer, Dave Johnson, who was. Uh, I worked for a man in, uh, who had a dairy farm when I was. I started out my career doing mostly dairy cattle, and I switched over to horses over a period of years. My favorite um, dairy farmer was Elmer Johnson. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. And that's very much patterned after him.
and his the kind of guy he was. Exactly. Very good. Yeah. Any other characters? And that's the one that stands out. And of course, your wife was was, was there a model for your wife? No, who? that was totally made. That up. was totally made. Up. Was nothing <laughs> like Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like Bonnie. No, <laughs> no drugs. No horses. <laughs> And Charlie's yes, my, yes, so, you know, I, over 50 years as an equine practitioner, and Bonnie never really was comfortable around a horse. And, and my, I, we have a farm in New Gloucester, and I used to have horses. I do horses on the road, but I also had horses truck into my farm, people who were very far away. Or people didn't want to pay for a farm call. They'd, they'd truck their horse in. Wow. <clears throat> and Bonnie... So she saw a lot of horses, and she never really was comfortable around them. Tell the story about me taking a nap. Well, yeah, so, so, one, so one day this horse came, this beautiful Arabian came, and um, out behind our barn there's a round pen so we can exercise horses, and the she, she, lady started to trot this horse. I wanted to see the horse move. And this was a magnificent, just everything was working right. It was just like, wow. So I had to go in the house and wake her up. I said, you got you to gotta come see something. So she comes downstairs from right now. <laughs> you want me to watch the What? I thought, I want you to see this horse go. This is something you don't see very often. You woke me up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever been forgiven. <laughs> Every once in a while, um, uh, I would, maybe my technician wasn't there, and so I would, and maybe the owner, for some reason, was doing something else or going to a trailer, and I'd ask Bonnie, do you mind holding the horse? And so <laughs> Bonnie would say, okay, and she'd hold the horse's lead shank very tightly, and she'd go up to the horse's face, and she'd say, whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> And I said, Bonnie, the horse is already woed. <laughs> <laughs> so the horse, horses would get uptight. Bonnie cannot handle a horse well. No, no, no uh, not, not one of her strengths. That may be in my next book. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great scene. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Whoa. So then he tells me, just talk to the horse. Yes. I think that works, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> How did you I, because I'd say, Oh, you have nice brown eyes. I don't know how to talk to a horse. But whatever I would say became a funny story at supper <laughs> later on. And that didn't help the relationship. <laughs> yeah. We got through it. Yeah. Yeah. But we got some miniature donkeys. Oh. And we had those. Um, and the only rule, the only rules, wrong word, but my only request was that the stall they were in had its own in and out. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have to do anything. And then I remember the first, and I got very used to them. In other words, the, they could go out a, a free yeah, will. Yeah, you didn't yeah. have to move them from here or there or yeah. do anything. Like a donkey door. <laughs> yeah, Instead and I, the first door. time, <laughs> the first, uh, the, yeah, the first time I, I had to feed them, I remember standing in the door with hay and going <laughs> into the paddock because I didn't want to go near them or anything oh, like that. Aww. But but we worked all that out, didn't we, David? Yeah, we did. <laughs> and now you have goats, right? We don't have anything anymore because we go to Florida a lot. Oh. Okay. But uh, and then there's nobody there to take care of the animals. Okay. We've had okay. goats. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We've had a. How did you uh, know that? I was hoping you had goats. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. I love the goats. <laughs> I was hoping you had them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had a. Let's see. We had a German breed of goat. <laughs> what was the name of that breed? But they cried so long. They were babies. Yeah. And and David was. I think you were going to recommend uh, maybe goats for Costa Rica for them. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to have goats so he knew about mm -hmm. the whole. They could jump. Mm -hmm. And so we had to put a lid on top of them. But mm -hmm. one night they cried so much that our neighbor across the street, which isn't like across the street, right. yeah. came over to see who was crying. Oh. And what was going on. <laughs> What were you doing? They were cute. <laughs> they were being chased by dogs. Yeah. So they were really pa panicked. Yeah. They, they were a German uh, meat goat, and I can't remember the name of the breed. Do you, uh, the, well, wasn't the common ones like Toggenbergs or uh, a lot of the... I'm a vegan, so I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we didn't... Look at a goat as a we, pet. We, didn't, we weren't raising them for meat. They were just company, but... And learning about very, the, very athletic breed. And the, wow, they just... 
could escape anything. Goats are so clever. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah. Though. They're, they're fun, and they have a great sense of humor. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, a couple of things. Did you watch Mr. Ed growing up? Or did <laughs> uh, I didn't even begin to appreciate horses until I was in vet school. I thought I was, I thought I was going to go into dairy work, and I did. And then I slowly made the transition. Somebody in Maine was selling their equine practice, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about getting into horses, so I just, so we moved here, and yeah, here. yeah. What so no, 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 I, I, there was no thought of that, yeah. yeah. Well, Although I do remember Mr. Ed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. go back and watch. Did you have a ride? Did you have a ride? Yeah, I, I actually, after I started working on horses, I took lessons because I, I was working for a lot of dressage riders. Right. And the terms, I didn't know what the terms were all about because we didn't learn that in vet school. And so I thought, I better, uh, people would talk to me a complaint about their horse. And I, I didn't know the terms, the dressage terms. Or they would talk about what level they were riding. It didn't mean a thing to me. So I started to ride, took lessons so I could learn. Yeah. Mm. The question I had was, you know, all creatures great and small, which I'm sure you all have seen, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about turning those into like a mini series, your books? Because, you know, animals are such, as they say in the street, trending today, you know, and yeah. that might be an interesting kind of mini series. We're, mini we're just waiting for Hollywood to call. <laughs> <laughs> I sit by my, I have my phone right here. <laughs> so It'll vibrate. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, this is, yeah, this book, uh, we talked about, I mean, we kid about it, but the, that's what we call it, Tides Harbor Mystery. It's, it's going to be a series. Mm -hmm. And I sound like I'm selling it, but I am. It's, <laughs> it's really, it's really unique. I don't think you've ever read a mystery where you have veterinarians actually solving the mysteries and having veterinary medicine mixed into the story because uh, we have we have real cases the cases that are in the book are ones that we've actually seen and some are woven in part of the mystery and some are just kind of they were, they were like McFadden's cat that wasn't part of the mystery but I introduced McFadden because he's going to be he's going to be part of the mystery so they're all kind of they're all intertwined but I don't think there's any book that has veterinary medicine as part of the the fabric of the mystery it's really cool did you ever think about having one of the animals solve the mystery? This is only our first book. <laughs> How do you know that's not what happened? <laughs> that's right. Jack is very smart. Jack the dog is very smart. Little clue. Yeah, we're, yeah. It's, Did you always know you wanted to write as well, or is... Um, I love, I love writing. I just love writing. And um, I don't know when that really started, actually, but... Um, Mr. Reader, probably. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a reader. I, and there's no place I'd rather be in a library. Yeah. I'm very comfortable in any library I walk into. You know, you could put me in here and lock me in here for eight hours, I'd have a ball. I would have a ball. I'd love it. Good, you're always welcome. So, you know, <laughs> I think writers, a good writer has to be a, a reader, a, a avid reader. But um, I have a, I'm a part of a, I've been part of a writing group in Florida. We meet in Florida at a senior center. And also it's, uh, when I come home, I jump into the group on Zoom. And so you have to submit a piece every week. Well, you don't have to, but, you, you know, we all do. And um, so that's kept me writing. Even when we, you know, I, all through these books. Because I had written two, two books before this. But you wrote for horse of course and a oh that's where it started digest, that's right that's and right then the horse's mane that's right i wrote for the th a newspaper down. called the horse's mane which came out once a month and and i wrote a column for that for 10 years and um so that was you know lots and lots of stories and somebody said make it a book so that was my first book which was called mane horse doctor and then um because of some issues around euthanasia, I, I, I went, I'm, I'm tr looking for sources. And there's no book on euthanasia on horses. So I wrote one called Goodbye, Old Friend. That's my favorite book. Um, and it's not very long, but it's the principles of euthanasia and how owners feel, how veterinarians feel. Um, you know, what, what do you do with the body of a horse, a thousand pound horse? What do you do with it? Big problem today. Um, 
So they tried to cover all that stuff. And what do you do with the emotions as a veterinarian? And what do you do with the emotions as an animal owner and lover? Yeah. That's a, yeah, excellent book, even for small animal lovers. I know you don't want to give it away, so I'm not asking you to give it away, okay? But I don't read mysteries because mysteries typically involve a murder, and it, it bothers me. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, because people are murdered. You, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Even though that might be a fictional mystery I'm reading, like, I know it's like, it's happening, you know what I mean? People are trying to solve, you know, so I don't, I avoid them because they disturb me, okay? Well, Am the, I gonna be really horribly disturbed if I read your book? There's a whole category of mysteries okay. called cozy mysteries. Yeah. Okay. You've heard of cozy? Okay. It's so a cozy mystery. This okay. is a cozy okay. mystery. Okay. This would not, okay. this would okay. not bother you. Do you watch okay. Murder, She Wrote? No. No. With Jessica Fletcher? No, I don't watch a lot of TV. I mean, I was like because back I, in the 80s. I sit and read. That's a similar <laughs> flavor yeah. if you're familiar okay. with okay. it. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not saying that there's no deaths per se, but nothing like what you would think. Right, okay. Yeah, no, well, okay. Mm -mm. no it's a cult. It's a very uh, it's entertaining. You, you're trying to figure out what's going on. The I think the characters are great. Um, it's not graphic. It's not graphic, okay. not at all. Okay. The uh, <laughs> Your wife, because I hate graphic, graphic blood and guts. Yeah, I mean, there's veterinary descriptions, but it's not, right, 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 you know, not right, disgusting. Yeah. So, so it just has that that really neat blend of the mystery and the characters. And it's a small town on the coast of Maine, and that lends itself to an atmosphere that the people who like us that live here yeah. you can identify with, and the people who don't always have this image of Maine. And the little the little town on the coast, so it kind of gives. It, yeah, it's really cool. No, I, I don't think you'll be bothered by it at no, all. No, not at all. Okay. Great question, Ralph. Though. Sounds like you wrote different chapters. Yes. Instead of writing chapters together. Good question. How did you collaborate? That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It, this was not always a smooth road. Yeah, <laughs> that this was the. Ref I don't know how the friendship survived. But <laughs> yeah, but it, it did. So. If you see in the in the index, it has chapter one, the owl, Charlie Harrison. So that means Charlie is the first person. That's me. I'm writing. Then uh, the third chapter is the rabid fox, Bob Smiley, written in first person. So that's Dave's story. So you can see the difference in style, but it doesn't seem to bother readers. It, it, it kind of blends in. And then there's a chapter, for instance, the old mill. There's no name after that. That's, that's written in third person, and it was written by Dave. So, it's, so you don't know who it's, but it's third person. So it's all it's first person. So Charlie's is me, you know, me writing Charlie, and, and that's how, we, that's how we, we did that. So that's a good question, Ralph. Mm. So in the, there's nothing, no blends in the chapter. When I write the chapter, I wrote the chapter. When you came to that crossroad, did you do rock, paper, scissors? Did you flip a <laughs> coin? Or, I mean, as to John always won. <laughs> I had a two-headed coin. <laughs> he never knew it. <laughs> you notice I always called heads. It, it, you know, it's really, really, it's John's book. No, 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 no. It's not. He keeps saying that. I'm just the one that bugged him all the time. So is it chronological? Information uh, and chapters overlap or go back and forth? No, it's it's chron it's it's, yeah, it's, it's a linear it's a linear time. Yeah, yeah. linear time. So is it like you two are this? getting together and discussing an event in town as it went along? Yeah, well, sometimes we'd be in the, in the vet office together. Yeah. And if it was me, if, if I was, if Charlie, if it was first person Charlie, I would, Bob would come in and we'd have a conversation, but it'd be written first person Charlie with the conversation. So Bob and I would be together, but whoever's writing it would be the first person writing it. But there's no flashbacks. I don't. Yeah, no flashbacks. No, it's all linear. Yeah, it's pretty linear. It takes yeah. place probably in a period of a couple of weeks, two or three, four weeks maybe. I really, I'm mm. really vague on time, mm. um, yeah. on purpose. Right. Uh, it's not months goes by. Um, it's just you just it just flows. You, you know you don't have to worry about the time. So seasons don't have anything to do with it, right? Seasons. No, no. it's all it's no. all spring. Season does play a role. And that is springtime. Yes, that's and right. that's that's important. It's a, that's an important uh, clue. It, it kind of 
it's woven into the story. So that's, that is important. Just like my next book is in the fall of the same year. In the fall, it's very important that it's fall. So, yes. So if you wrote a chapter, would Dave have to write to read that before he wrote the next chapter? Or a chapter next? Y usually. And vice versa? Yeah. Interesting. Well, especially since Dave forced me to be the one to do the storyline. <laughs> And how he forced me is, I'm not going to write anymore. You got unless you unless you do the storyline. So okay. Yes, that's true. It, it was a threat. That's true. So with with Dave's with Dave's stories, Dave's chapter, I would I would read I would had to read the chapter in a way because I had to make sure that the storyline was because I because he was putting he was putting in new ideas all the time, and I was changing storylines because his new ideas were good and I liked them. Says, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'll do that. I've never told him that, but that's what that's what I was doing, and it, it worked out really. It worked out well that way. And then he, you you know, you read mine, mm -hmm. and it and it worked. You know, it worked. He kind mm -hmm. of knew what I was said and knew what was. Um, Isn't it wonderful that you can make a document and send it to somebody? I just it's so <laughs> phenomenal because we live, you know, two hours apart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, down to Elliot, and he's up an hour, I think. Hour? To, yeah, hour and I mean, that's, that's far. Yeah, but a couple of long lunches at the Portland Mall. Oh, know, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had a we, we wanted to, we wanted to meet. We <laughs> thought we should be meeting. So we thought we what should. Was, what was halfway between the two? It turned out to be the Portland Mall, and it turned out to be, uh, if you, and you can't go to a regular restaurant, because if you can have a two-hour conversation, you've tied up a table, you know, and you start getting dirty looks. So I said, let's meet in the, uh, in the food court. So we did. We just meet over coffee or a yeah. snack, something like that. Yeah, and we could watch all the funny people walk by. <laughs> Dave loves to watch the people walk by. So I'd be talking to him, and <laughs> his eyes would be like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, well, doc, you know, Doctor Smiley should be doing this, and he's going. <laughs> <laughs> there are some real characters that go through the main mall. It's really amazing. Of course, we met during lunch. Yeah. So everyone's oh, brother was there. With the yeah, oh, the kids busy. running around, and that was kind of fun. And it was getting close to Christmas. Yeah, it was. Mm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we wrote this in about ten months. It took about ten months. So who's your publisher? It's published by Pat Gott, who is in Norway. Okay. She's a very interesting person and um, quite opinionated, but she's very knowledgeable. And she's very uh, affordable. Affordable. She's a horse client. That's how you put it. I knew her because she's a horse client. Right. Yeah. So we fin we when we were getting to know each other, YCCC, uh, we discovered that we each wrote a book before. I wrote uh, Why Is My Cat Looking at Me, uh, Ponderings of a Small Town Vet. And he wrote the uh, Horse Doctor. And Goodbye, Old Friend. Yeah. No, you didn't write that. Was your first book? But oh. No, Main Horse Doctor. Main Horse Doctor. So we were working on our second books, and they said, who, who published your book? He just kind of wanted to know my publisher. And I said, well, I, I, I published this big company, national company called Dorrance, and they charged me an arm and a leg, and they gave me nothing. They may have done the editing. That's, that's about it. And I, I, I lost money big time. So Dave was interested in in changing publishers. That's I figured because you're asking me about it. And after I thought about it, I said, "No, you don't want Torrance. Uh, who do you have?" And Dave said, "Pat." And so how much did she charge? And she he told me, "I, I want to go over there. I don't care if she's kind of hard to deal with, and um, and she's you know she's she has her own mind and stuff because the the cost um, was." One tenth of what I paid. But I think that your publisher also promised you some publicity, and he and gave never you nothing. Gave, and so. it gave me nothing. But Pat is very straightforward, and she, she says, "Number one, I'm not going to edit a single thing. So don't ask me to edit. I won't do it. Right? <laughs> Hates editing. But she knows all the ins and outs of getting on um, uh, Amazon. Amazon. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, she does. She yeah. does that part and the copyright." And she has a great person to do the, the actual printing and stuff. So the mechanics of it. And 
it was great because the cost is literally, I can't believe she charges so little. But she doesn't do any editing. We had the two of our editors right there. I mean, it took. It cost um, you big time, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you say, Michelle? It cost him big time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A new house, <laughs> car. <laughs> we have two library friends, librarians, and they edit for David. One for content, especially mysteries, same thing John's talking about, and the other who is a comma period <laughs> fanatic. So they read David's books. Um, I don't do TikTok. I, I don't do it, but I've I've heard from multiple sources that a part of TikTok is book talk, and yeah. people are actually like people that you know are you know are you know like you know um, they're not big time authors you know so they have yeah. their own you know yeah. books you know and they're going on there and their sales are exploding. So if you have any like grandchildren or whatever that do TikTok and can go do the book talk thing, hmm. you know, it's supposed to be phenomenal. Hmm. Did um, not know that. Yeah. It's, it's, I've it's, never it's, done it's TikTok so, either. I, get, I've never, I yeah, got I, it, honey. I, I, I got it. Yeah, you know, but, but there's a book talk part of it. Oh. And it's supposed hmm. to be like people, you know, authors are going on there and their books are just exploding. Hmm. And, you know, their sales. Yeah. Hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. I've been doing a... F Check that out for us, John, would you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay Michelle, thanks. We have something in the network that can, like, do that part of it for you. She's my computer. <laughs> but you have a, a, a blog, don't you? Mm -hmm. And I have a Facebook page. I've been, for the last, gee, almost a month and a half, every day I've been putting in a, just a little paragraph of my experiences as a vet. Not necessarily anything written here. And I've been, my... I, I, of course, I lassoed all my friends on my list, but I'm getting regular readers and comments. And it's Dr. Dr. John Hunt, veterinarian author. If you just look look that up on Facebook, you should get me. And I've been writing every day, and it's it's been building. And you and your blog, what do you do? Um, I change it about once a month. What about your vet schools? Do they, I mean, utilize in the yeah. curriculum? Yeah. <laughs> You know, here's a funny story. Um, I, I went back to Cornell for my 50th, and I took copies of the book to give my classmates, sure. and I took a copy to the library. So Bonnie and I went up to the library, and I said, you know, I, I wrote a book. I'm in the class of 1969. I'd like to present the library with a book. And she said, well, we really can't use it. And I said, I mean, just to stick on the stacks. She says, there are no stacks. I said, what are you talking about? She says, we don't have any stacks anymore. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Wow. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Yeah, everything's done on the computer. That's oh. sad. Well, I think it is. Yeah. Very sad. So I don't know. That how. is surprising though about Cornell. I mean. Just leave it in the president's office and they're waiting for people to pick up and <laughs> they're waiting to talk to the president. Well, I did <laughs> give him one too. Okay. But <laughs> I never heard back from them. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of not having getting any more letters for uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. John. No wonder you're not. You haven't heard yeah. from them. <laughs> yeah. You asked about uh, how how Dave started writing, and eventually, you kept, what how you uh, started was you were writing for newspaper uh, for right. magazines. And that's what happened to me too. I wrote for Bucksport Enterprise. Just a little weekly thing, just to build my practice when I first got there. So I wrote that for a couple of years. I turned that into a, my very first book that's unpublished, no one knows about. It's called Ask the Vet. And then um, I started this radio show on WERU, which is in Orland. You can stream that. As a matter of fact, my show that I did for 12 years, I just stopped last June, but he's still running them. Seven, well, you can go on the archives. It's 7.30 Sunday morning. It's a little three to five minute uh, show that I produced. I wrote it and I went to the studio and I, you know, did the voice and everything. And I did that every week. So I had to write something every week and I did that for 12 years. And that's how I got my training. Uh, mm. And what helped me was my dad teaching me how to write well when I was in seventh and eighth and ninth grade. He was a professor of psychology, a really good writer, 
he did a lot of editing for Cyclopedia Britannica. And he taught me how to not be so verbose and to be very um, clean. Uh, I'm not as clean as Dave, but um, you not be so wordy. So that and 12 years of just writing something every week. And I turned my, my second, third book. Those are all my radio shows. So that's kind of how I got it. And then this is just... This one's my first, like, creative. I love, I love the book that you wrote, and it's a funny book anyway, but the title is, Why Does My Cat Look at Me Like That? I thought, <laughs> what a phenomenal book title. <laughs> but John said it doesn't sell well because people pick it up and say, I don't have a cat. I don't like cats. But it's not just about cats. It's about his practice. Yeah. yeah. And so, it should have been the other way. It should have been the subtitle is Ponderings of a Small Town Vet. That should have been the title. And then the cat thing below. But that was a question my sister asked me on the phone from Ch in Chicago. We were just talking all of a sudden. She says, what, John, why is my cat looking at me like that? Yeah. I just fell on the floor laughing. How the hell, how, how the heck do I know? <laughs> I actually do answer that question in the book. And I'm not going to tell you, cause you got to buy the book. <laughs> the cats, when they... <laughs> there you go. What are the uh, stereotypes about vets? Are, are there any stereotypes about... Vets That's a good question. What, what do you think they are? I, I, I don't know. I mean, you don't have one? You don't, you don't have a stereotype? You, stereotype. Or um, Caring. <laughs> compassionate. <laughs> friendly. Really yeah, nice. Right. Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you have to <laughs> trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly. Friendly, courteous, kind, <laughs> obedient, careful. I, I, I would imagine that rather than going into regular bodily medicine, that there's some kind of affiliation, association early. I mean, I'm a believer in childhood issues, you know, kind of a Freudian kind of perspective. The childhood issues help shape who you are later on. And then you must have some kind of affinity around uh, animals at a very young age. That I you did. Bonded with. I did. Right. One cat. Yeah. Toby. No? Right. Animals are so much better. Oh, absolutely. I, I <laughs> trust animals. But, but yeah, uh, like, but it's just like... You know, it's much more than humans. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Those, those I'm afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> animals, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> I have a whole chapter in this that... Our whole chapter is how we got interested yeah. in vet medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This oh, book. Good. It's very... Uh, it, it's kind of an interesting road. Because I didn't, I didn't know I wanted to be a vet until I got up. I already had a master's in zoology from Michigan State University. I was 22, 23, and I went back home with my tail between my legs because I wanted to be, wanted to get a PhD, and I got, well, it's in the book, I got kicked out. Isn't that the first line? It's the, the, first, the first line. The first line of this book I really like. John, you're not smart enough. That's the first line of my book. And that was what I was told by one of the professors on my master's degree committee just before I defended my thesis paper. He must have gotten a short, short straw. I can't imagine any of my committee members wanting to tell me I wasn't invited to continue on in the zoology doctoral pro program at Michigan State University. And that talks about the scene in the, in the office, which is kind of... Yeah, it's a good, good chapter. Yeah. So, um, so that was the catalyst. That was the beginning. It took another couple years, but then finally, it, yeah, I, well, I went back home to New York, and then I tell, then, them, tell them about your dad. Well, yeah, um, I went back home uh, to New York, Dobbs Ferry, and uh, I didn't know didn't know what what to do. There weren't any jobs in zoology, um, and I wanted to be a teacher, but there weren't any teaching jobs or anything like that. So I coached uh, girls track. I was the first track coach in my my old high school. I taught a biology course at a small college, um, things like that. And finally, I was uh, applied to a job for a New York Cooperative Extension. I thought that would fit. It's biology, animals, education. And I didn't hear from them. I didn't hear from them, so I got discouraged. So I, literally one day, we were sitting in the kitchen in New York, and my dad, uh, I said, I don't know what to do. He said, what, you know, what do you like? What is it that's interested you? I said, well, I like to learn a lot. I like to always be learning. I like biology. I like animals. And I like people. 
I like to interact with people, and kind of those things. He kind of said, well, veterinary, maybe being a veterinarian. Is that? I said, oh, that's, okay, I thought about it. We talked about it some more. I said, okay, uh, I'm not, I don't want to go to Cornell. <laughs> I had to think about Cornell. Was it too highbrow? What was the problem? Yeah, I, don't think I, I didn't think I could get in. <laughs> so my dad and mom both went to Michigan State University. I had been there already, got my master's there. My, my parents were alumni. My grandfather was a professor there. So I had, and I grew up the first 10 years of my life in Chicago. So the Midwest was my true calling. So I moved back, spent a year taking courses and trying to you know, apply. And I worked at two different vet hospitals and that's a whole nother book. Um, and I applied and I don't know because I'm not an A student. I was not an A student. I got in. That's how I got in. And I did okay in that. I mean, I wasn't an A student at that school, but I, you know, I'm, I think I made Michigan State proud, I hope. It was, it was really quite astonishing how that, so I was 22, 23 before I decided vet medicine. Um, I, I have this saying that is true about me. No matter what the weather is out there, I'd rather be out there than in here. I just love the outside and I love farms. When I was a kid, um, I, I was working on dairy farms all the way through school and I just loved, loved that. <clears throat> and, I, and I went to a two-year college because I didn't have the grades to get into Cornell or any four-year institution out of high school. And so uh, I went to a two-year ag and tech school at Delhi, New York to learn how to be a dairy farmer. And then when I, I went, and after school, I was managing a dairy farm, and I realized then, boy, this ties you down. You're going to be milking cows 365 days twice a day. So I didn't know what to do. So I, I joined the Marine Corps, you know, just like, boom. And um, three years of that, I was ready for something else. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, I like the outside. I like animals, and who knows, maybe. And then I... Uh, went, got accepted at Cornell only because, um, and if, if you have kids that aren't, maybe you don't think they're college material, um, I think, every, you know, it's just a question of finding the right niche, I think. And let's see, how did that happen? Went Talk to. Up a little. Hmm? When you were in high school, because I love this part, and when we were all applying to college, it was, I think, $10 for each application. And he sent his money in to Cornell, and it came back, don't waste your money. <laughs> and his money back, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. you went on this Del High and Marine Corps and everything, finished undergrad back at Cornell, got into the vet school. Now, I'm not sure where this next piece comes, but you were asked... I was undergraduate at Cornell at the time. You were still an undergraduate then. You weren't at the vet school yet, but you were asked to a address a group of... What were they? Prospective Cornell kids? Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. So the gentleman who introduced David as this key speaker to this group of newbies was the person that had turned him down <laughs> all those years before. <laughs> and you let him know it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I got a great round it of just applause. Came all around it. It was really wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And I interrupted you. I don't know where you were going. Isn't life funny? And looking back on it, um, I could have been happy doing other things, but not as happy as I was working on farms. I mean, you know, veterinary medicine for me was the perfect niche. It really was the perfect. Do you yeah. feel that way? Yeah. Do you have one favorite uh, story or animal that during your time as practicing veterinarians, one thing that animal, that story that just sticks out in your mind? Oh my God. Favorite or great story? Are you looking for a sad story, a happy story? Not a sad one. Let's do happy. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I'm still thinking okay. over here. <laughs> two two real short ones. One is Sunday afternoon. I, I had to take call, small animal call. I was sharing it with a, a vet in town next to me. So every other weekend I'd be on call. And I got a, a call Sunday afternoon. Uh, Todd Gifford, his name was, 
And Todd was an interesting guy. He, he drank a lot and was doing drugs, but he also bred golden retrievers. He, he said, Doc, my, my golden's having a hard time having puppies. So I, he brought them down to the clinic. The clinic in those days was a little, a little farmhouse, and uh, the waiting room was not any bigger than this. I had an old rug on it. So he brought them in, laid, them down on, laid her down on the rug. Pardon me? You said it was a girl. <laughs> laid her down on the rug, yes. And make long story short, uh, I helped her have her puppies. Didn't have to do a C-section or anything. And he said, Doc, I don't have any money, which was very typical of emergency calls. Um, they don't tell you until after you've done your service. And apparently, I love animals. I don't need to be paid. That's their approach. And I, I said, oh, man, Todd, I mean, this is an emergency call. And he goes, I'll tell you what, you get pick of the litter. So I got a pick of the litter, and her name was Sally. I almost cried thinking about her. She was the best golden I've ever, the best dog. So the second story is uh, there was a rescue. Rescue leagues are in Bucksport, and there was a, uh, people brought in this, this dog because they were, in rescue leagues they have uh, foster parents. So they go to a, a home, a foster parent, for two or three weeks that they can find a home. So these foster parents brought in this rescue dog. And it was a border collie, and it was, he was just first of all he was scared stiff. He was thin, and he had hookworms and fleas, and and he just looked like a mess. So I went in just to do the the vet check for him and to get him help get him straighten out. And we looked at each other in the eyes, and that was it. I said, I'll take him. Oh, you know, I still had to go through all the BS. <laughs> Do you really love animals? Are you going to take care of them? Where's your home? And, and those people were kind of friends of mine, too. And I go, what the, what the heck? But I did. I jumped through the hoops, and that was Ben. Did you my, have to do a home visit? Did they have to do a home visit? Yeah, yeah, they did all the, you know, it's, it's, geez. I'm a vet. Guess it didn't make any difference. So I, that was Ben, my second dog. And he was just, that's Ben, Michelle knew, knew Ben. And he, he was a, was kind of a psycho because he had, first year of his life was in a cage. He never got, um, never got uh, imprinted on people very well. So he, or another dog. Or another dog. He so, dog. And, and stressed that like he just, and it took years for him to kind of get out of his shell, but he was so devoted to me, he came to my clinic every morning with me and was, slept under, under my table. And he's, he's the inspiration of Jack and the Donuts. So if you read this book, that's Ben. <laughs> and the funny part of that is, so he'd go to work with him every day. Some days, John would come home and I'd be like, For lunch. Ben? <laughs> yeah. Ben I forgot Ben. Oh. Of course, all, <laughs> this whole staff loved him. But he'd be curled up, because he was so used to his first year of his life, curled up in this little kennel, oh. that he felt comfortable, because that's what, all he knew. Mm -hmm. So he'd be in the, well. where my feet were, at this big old wood desk, he'd be in, in there. But he, he stole... <laughs> he stole my donuts once in a while, and, and I had an associate that didn't last very long. I fired his, you know what, and he had a sandwich on, on the table, and we, were, we left the office and he came back. Where's my sandwich? Where's my sandwich? Did you leave it out? Well, ben got it. Ben was curled up. <laughs> Innocent. So those are my two stories. So one of the benefits, I think, of uh, farm life is that kids are brought up and, and get quite a foundation and a lot of aspects of life that others don't um, brought up in cities <clears throat> and one at late one afternoon I got a call from it was up in Green Maine and this guy said I, my, my horse is colicky he's really sick you come out I said sure and I came out and um, I checked the horse over and I knew the I knew the horse was gonna die and his pulse was over a hundred normal was 28 to 40 his membranes, you pulled back the membrane, and his, they were very muddy. And I said, the horse is going to die. Uh, this is too late for, he's probably got a twisted gut, and this is really too late for surgery. I forgot the most important part of this. As I, before I left the house, I said to my son, I thought it was going to be a quick call. I said, you want to come with me? How old was Jim? Five years old. Come on. So he said, okay, sure, I'll go with you. So he jumps in the truck with me, and we got this. So I'm explaining this to these people. And thinking, oh, now my son's going to watch me put a horse down because this horse is not going to make it. And the guy said, um, well, could we send him to a clinic? I said, 
he wouldn't make the trip. He wouldn't, you know, this horse needs to be euthanized. And this, this was a, a very much a sometimes client. I didn't really like him very well. And he says, do you think you could be mistaken on this? I said, no. I've been at this long enough. I know this horse is dying. If you want, I can leave this farm and you can watch this horse die. It'll probably happen sometime around midnight or we can take care of it now. He says, well, okay then. Okay then. So um, I put the horse down, <clears throat> and which it just involves a, uh, the, the uh, pentobarbital in the jugular vein. And I'm packing up my stuff to go. He says, prove it. I said, prove what? And he said, I want to see that this horse really wouldn't make it. And I said, well, what are you looking for? He says, I want to see an autopsy. I said, okay. I went to the truck, got my autopsy knives, and I thought, not only has my son just watched the horse die, he's now going to watch one with guts all over the lawn. So, um, and that's what happened. And I thought, the only way to make this okay with my son, I didn't care about the client at all, was to explain everything I was doing. I said, see, look, this is a liver. Look how big it is. Yours is about this big. Look at the horse's heart. It's huge. This is what makes a horse a horse. Your heart's about as big as your fist. And I just was doing, and Jim was very interested. He, yeah, oh, well, okay, I see. And, and, and then I opened up the abdomen and just all this black gut came out. And I said, this is the color of normal gut, Jim. This gut here is dead. It's already dead. And I looked up at the owner. He said, okay, and he was getting sick anyway. He said, enough, okay. And that was the deal. But, um, <laughs> My son uh, never went into veterinary medicine. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder why. He's now a boat captain. <laughs> as far away from veterinary medicine as you can get. Boat captain. But my, my daughter went on calls with me, too. And she, uh, she uh, went into a, a sort of a branch of medicine. So she liked, she loved it. And, you know, either you're wired for it or you aren't, I think. Yep. Yeah. None that of my was kids are. not so. a happy story. <laughs> I'm sorry? That was not a happy story. No. Was that what you were looking for, a happy story? No. no Sorry. No, no. Too late. You, you were okay. too late. <laughs> See, I want to be the popular one, so. <laughs> you, you should have said the horse is out of the barn. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Any other know. questions before we, I know we have to go, but you're closed and everything. Um, anything else you wanted to say about, it's, it. Ralph had a good question about the flow of it. It, it flows pretty well, I think. Mm -hmm. The story, yeah. You know, and from chapter to chapter, it, it, which is nice. And that, that was the hard part, is to get two different writers writing chapters that flow and make a reference, have Dave make a reference in the beginning of his chapter about the last part of my chapter. Mm. So it would be a connection. Otherwise, yeah. it would it, be too choppy. Choppy. So and that, so will your next one pick up where this one leaves uh, off? My next one's called <laughs> Dangerous Animals. This is Animals in Dan Danger. It takes place in the autumn of the same year, in October. And same characters, got some new ones, uh, new mystery, and uh, some exciting things. I just wrote a very powerful chapter today. I'm not going to even, even. I'm not going to even give you a hint what it is, but I'm almost. I'm almost finished with it. But it takes place in October, and there's some scenes in the county fair, um, some scenes out on the boat because, of course, Tides Harbor is this tide is this harbor that when the tide goes out, it uncovers all these rocks like the main coast does. When it comes in, it looks like a pristine lake, and only the lobstermen know how to get in. And lower tides that plays that plays a role in this book too um, so the oceans involved um, got some guptal hill oh well, good that's a good one no no well up the hills a little bit involved this this one is up the hills no more guptal hill yeah a little bit good you can't repeat stuff you got to make new stuff right yeah so anyway, I'm almost finished with that I'll probably be finished well then the editing mm -hmm. Bonnie you help, <laughs> you help me Bonnie with editing <laughs> 
<laughs> what did you ask me? I was somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. You see, that's, that's a good technique. <laughs> If someone's asking you to do a favor, you just say, uh, I wasn't. What? <laughs> no, I'm going I'm to need some. I can't depend on just Michelle doing all the editing. I need editors for my next book, so I'll be. I'll be uh, asking you to edit. I was asking if you could edit. We'll uh, talk about it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, half, I'm only half kidding. I did when I started editing. I'm very used to editing David's books and his articles, and I'm tough on him. And I edit every week. Um, and I say, throw this out, start over, or I don't say it like that. You know, <laughs> I don't understand this, or you write better than that. But I, I couldn't say that to John. I had no relationship with <laughs> John. So in the beginning, I you? remember I apologized and said, John, I, I don't know how to do this with you. And I just um, said, just go ahead. And yeah. it ended up being you just went ahead. He did, yeah. And your changes but and crit critiques. Gentler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Michelle is very, very hard. <laughs> yeah. but, and, and David's writing is, he just told me today, he's, he's starting his own book. Just starting it out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ixnay with the <laughs> Uk Bay. I didn't know about that, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Well, I started a short story and I thought, I, oh, I, 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 could, I could make this into, this yeah. would be oh, fun to write. Yeah, so. I love the beginning, yeah. yeah. So we're still writing. You'll yeah. be hearing. You'll be hearing from us. So I plan to I plan to continue these series. I already have the third one in my head. I really? know it's going to happen. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you're amazing. I'll, I'll still need your help. He's invaluable. He was invaluable with this book. He's even invaluable with this second book. You're a good you're a good friend. Yeah. Likewise. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank. I hope that. Hope we didn't bore you. Oh, uh, great. But, thank you. Well, thanks. Yeah.